catching one won't be easy. Ah, I can see one. Over there. It's under the boat. You got it? Oh, he's tough. <laughs> we got you. <laughs> You're a champion with that lasso. <laughs> This is the most dangerous part because I'm holding its jaws in my hands. If I don't hold it tight enough, or if I release it wrongly, it'll bite me. So I've learned to gain the animal's confidence and to manipulate it calmly. But if the crocodile manages to free itself, you're better off jumping overboard. <laughs> I'll attach it here. We've been using the same technique for capturing crocodiles for over a hundred years. Toby was the first scientist to penetrate this region. Etienne, his disciple, is taking over the reins. The Zapata Swamp was for a long time out of reach of mortal men. In this mangrove labyrinth hides one of the island's most fascinating species, the rhombifer, a crocodile which is only found here, and which is known as the Cuban crocodile. We're going to try to capture a few specimens to learn a bit more about the Cuban crocodile population, which we have here in the Zapata Swamp. It was Toby who began this study back in the 70s, 40 years ago. This is the only place in the world where they can be found living in the wild. They're nowhere else. But on its home territory, the Cuban crocodile is threatened with extinction. There are only 3,000 individuals surviving in these swamps. 90% of the species has disappeared in less than a century. Try to keep it still. That's it, I've got it. Let's see if it's a male or a female. It's a female. The Cuban crocodile is surrounded by another reptile, the American crocodile. They are similar in appearance, but from a genetic point of view, they are very different. The American crocodile has begun invading the territory of the Cuban one, and it's putting the species in danger. If the American mates with the Cuban, the purity of the species is finished. So much for catching them, now we need to carry them, which is less amusing. Etienne and Toby are totally tied up in the cause. For months now, they have been catching crocodiles to measure the level of intimacy between Cubans and Americans. Yeah. 20 centimeters. Fifteen, sixteen kilos. What? 
I've taken off a bit of its tail. With this sample, we're going to try to better understand the genetic identity of this group of crocodiles in the swamp. The point of this is to determine if we still have a lot of crocodiles which are 100% Cuban, or if these are already hybrids. That's one of the questions we're trying to answer. Hybridization. If the process is long-standing or recent. Hybridization is the main threat facing the Cuban crocodile. It's in danger of losing its genetic identity. The answer is in this simple test tube. The stakes are considerable and go beyond the boundaries of this swamp. The Cuban crocodile is a national symbol, particularly for those of us who live in Cuba. If you look at the shape of the island, it looks a bit like a reptile. Cuba is the crocodile island. It's a matter of pride. For me, the Cuban is the more beautiful of the two. You think differently? No. <laughs> The Cuban crocodile had help from another slippery customer, a political reptile, Fidel Castro. When he came to power in 1959, Fidel stood up for the animal. Saving the revolution meant saving the crocodile. To achieve this, he put together a surprising army of mercenaries. They were nicknamed the Cocodrilleros. All of them were poachers. Up until then, they had been crocodile hunters. But from then on, they captured crocodiles not to kill them, but to save them. Thousands of Cuban specimens were taken out of the swamp to protect them from the invasion of the gringo crocodiles. An unusual exfiltration designed to avoid any hybridization. They were placed in a closed sanctuary in which they could reproduce amongst themselves. The cocodrilleros became the heroes of the Zapata swamp. This Bay of Pigs region became famous. It is where the long arm of the CIA tried unsuccessfully to invade Fidel's island in 1961. 